John Palmer joins me this week to discuss his long-awaited How to Brew 4th Edition book release. This is Beersmith Podcast number 148. This is Beersmith Podcast number 148, and it's early May 2017. This week, John Palmer joins me to discuss the new edition of How to Brew that he just released, which includes some 200 pages of new material. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now. Get 20% off your subscription when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2017. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. And you can read my new column called Ask the Experts there. Take advantage of their special deal now and use the offer code BEERSMITH2017 at BeerAndBrewing.com. Again, that's BeerAndBrewing.com. And also the Cornicle, a unique conical fermenter and kegging system that's all in one. The kegs feature a removable bottom, which makes cleanup a snap. But you can also attach the unique conical bottom to the keg and use it as a pressure-capable fermenter. Ferment, keg, and serve all in one vessel with the Cornicle from Blickman Engineering. Com. Find out more again at BlickmanEngineering.com. And also Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers, lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial from Beersmith.com today. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back John Palmer, author of the top-selling homebrew book in the world, How to Brew. He just released a completely revised fourth edition. Uh, a portion of the book is also available on John's website at howtobrew.com. John, it is fantastic to have you on the show again. Well, thank you very much, Brad. It's good to be here. Sorry for the state of my office. It's, uh, you caught me between articles. It looks lovely, just lovely. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, let's see. It's been almost a year since I've had you on the show. I've seen you a couple times since then. But uh, what right. have you been up to lately? Well, um, I've been finishing up the last throws of how to, of this edition of How to Brew. Had lots of last minute edits and uh, you know clarifications and that sort of thing. And uh, this year, I started as publications director for the Master Brewers Association. So, been busy working on the journal for that and uh, soliciting ideas for books to, that we're going to publish as part of the MBAA. Um, so, that's been keeping me busy as well. Very cool. What's the, what is the Master Brewers Association? I'm not that familiar with it. Oh well, it's one of the two uh, professional brewing societies here in the in the United States. Um, of course, we have affiliate members around the world, but um, the Master Brewers Association is kind of the um, resource for uh, craft brewers, for brewmasters, um, whether you know it's in a large microbrewery. Uh, such as Sierra Nevada, or you know, a, a, a very well-established large brewery such as Sam Adams, or Budweiser, or Miller Coors, um, any of these, uh, as well as the you know the, your local micros, uh, the Master Brewers Association tries to fill that technical niche of providing practical, applicable brewing information. Um, the American Society of Brewing Chemists, uh, by contrast is, well, very similar. However, they look more at uh, the science of brewing, uh, methods, testing. Um, so again, something that brewmasters would, you know, professional brewers would be interested in being a part of, but again, focusing a little bit more on the quality uh, measuring uh, testing side of the house. Awesome. Well, um, I know we wanted to talk about your new uh, new edition of How to Brew, but I was hoping you could tell us a story. I know we talked about it, oh, God, way back on, like, episode eight or nine of Beersmith Podcast <laughs> a million years ago. Um, yeah, we, but I was wondering if you could go through the story of how you actually came about to write, you know, writing uh, How to Brew back in the in the 90s. <clears throat> sure. Well, you know, I, I got into home brewing for purely sh- selfish reasons, like most people. Um, I wanted to be able to drink the dark beers that I enjoyed when I was in college, and uh, they weren't available here in California when I moved out here. Um, so I had uh, I had seen homebrewing done before when I was in college, so I knew it was possible. 
And uh, so around 1990, thereabouts, um, I started researching it on the library. Didn't have the internet back then. And, uh, you know, tried my first batch and it was terrible and did some more research, found out why it was terrible. And that's kind of what got me both writing and brewing, uh, you know, and led to where I am today. And uh, you originally self-published this. Well, first of all, you start you started by publishing it online, I think, right? Right. Um, I wrote the book, and I was doing it in conjunction with Brewing Techniques, which is a very popular magazine at the time. And um, unfortunately, they went out of business, um, you know, in the early well late '90s. And uh, so, therefore, we I took what I had written, and then we formatted it for the web. And published it to the web because I wanted the information to be available to people to help them brew good beer at home. And uh, then my wife said, well, you know, uh, we really should try to make some money off this, you know. Uh, and I said, okay, I will uh, see about self-publishing because at the time when I contacted other publishers, they were interested only in a, in a very small – beginner book, you know, 50 pages, 75 pages, uh, not the comprehensive volume that I wanted to do. They just didn't feel that there was a market for that. Um, so that's why I self-published. And the self-published book sold for about five years. And then uh, Brewer's Publications uh, took a look at the numbers and, you know, took another look at the, that uh, opportunity. And uh, we've been partners ever since. Awesome. Yeah, I remember you telling me you had a bunch of them in your garage originally. You were selling, literally selling yeah. them, selling yeah. them to all the uh, uh, homebrew shops. But of course, uh, Brewers Publications took it over, and now uh, uh, I have in my my hot little hands here the brand new edition, the fourth yep. edition of How to Brew, uh, which is some two hundred pages longer. I think it's uh, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, it's quite thick. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us about some of the stuff that's new in the in the in the new edition. Sure. Well, I went I, I went through it and revised every chapter. I mean, you know, as I read through it, um, thinking to myself, you know, okay, that's that's good, that's good. I did, I should have said this better. You know, going through and just making general revisions to the text. Um, also, trying to take another look at you know what's important for the new brewer to understand and reorganizing the chapters, reorganizing some of the material, try to get, you know, the information there so that the new new brewer can, you know, put their best foot forward, read and understand what they need to do to get the best beer possible. Um, then from there, it was a matter of uh, adding chapters where I felt that, you know, we've learned new things. Um so the fermentation chapter was uh, expanded, and now I discuss uh, more about how yeast actually live and work and uh, accomplish maturation of the beer, which is very important for beer quality. Um, also wrote chapters on how to brew strong beers, how to brew fruit beers, how to brew sour beers. And that, you know, these aren't these aren't the be all and end all of brewing knowledge. I mean, these are like, you know, fruit beers 101, sour beers 101, uh, you know, but they are designed to help the new brewer uh, brew that style of beer, brew a sour beer, uh, have it turn out right, and, you know, with a robust process that's not going to steer them wrong. So um, then, you know, they can get on to other websites such as yours and, milk the funk and you know there's a there's so many resources on the web these days it's incre just incredible but you know they can look up further information and uh take it from there awesome um well let's talk about some of the some of the new things you added i one of them uh, clearly was brewing a bag uh, something that really oh, yeah. uh, was not popular when you published the last edition but now has really become mainstream why don't you uh, maybe share a yeah. little bit about that chapter yeah, so um, as you say, you know, when the last time I published, which was 2005, 2006, um, batch sparging uh, had become the most popular uh, brewing method. You know, we're using a, a, bit, uh, a cooler as a mash tun um, instead of traditional continuous sparging. And 
Brew in the Bag was known, but it was kind of a I don't know, it was kind of in its infancy in terms of, you know, you steep your specialty grains or you steep a portion of malt. Um, it had been around for a long time. I remember seeing it advertised in Williams Brewing in the mid-90s. But um, it, w- it hadn't really become mainstream. Well, in the last 10 years, uh, it has become pretty mainstream. Um, for many brewers, it's the only method they brew. Um, it's there's large bags readily available now in home brew shops that make it, you know, easy to get started, and it's a, overall it's a fairly simple process. So, um, I wrote in the how to brew your first all grain batch. I have both a kind of a traditional batch sparge approach as well as a brew in a bag approach. Um, walk you through both of them with pictures so that, you know, depending on which method of mashing that you choose, uh, the instructions are there. And uh, we did an episode not, I think it was last year on fermentation, but uh, you also added a new chapter on fermentation and maturation. Yeah. So one one thing that's become very clear to me um, in the last 10 years is a warm maturation. We have traditions of cold maturation, in other words, lagering, where you ferment the beer at, you know, say 50 degrees Fahrenheit or, you know, what is that, um, 10 degrees, no, 12 degrees C. And then you would start cooling the beer down slowly to just above freezing and allow it to lager for an extended period of time based on uh, what the original gravity was. Mm -hmm. Well, that's you know that's traditional but in terms of the way the yeast actually function when once the yeast get below 40 degrees fahrenheit they really have very little activity they're not actually doing the maturation where they consume acetaldehyde consume diacetyl and clean up these byproducts from the fermentation um and so we've learned that if you keep the beer warm for maturation you keep it up, you know, 65, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, you know, uh, 20 degrees C. Um, then the yeast are much more active, uh, much more able to take up these substances and, you know, fully finish fermenting, finish matru- maturating the beer, uh, consuming these byproducts in just a few days. So um, once you've done that, now it's possible to cool the beer for clarification, settling the yeast, clearing the haze. Um, No further yeast activity is necessary, and the beer is actually ready to drink or ready to package in a much shorter time, a matter of one week or two weeks rather than one or or two months. So that's been a significant change in the book and, and explaining that to the reader. Yeah, I know uh, Marshall from Brewlosophy has done a whole series of experiments on fermenting right. lagers fairly warm, you know, in the I, in yeah. high 60s uh, F anyways. Um, mm-hmm. And he's had pretty good success with it. I mean, uh, blind panel, they can't really tell. You're right, yeah. right. And then yeah. Charlie uh, Charlie uh, uh, Bamforth was on a while ago, and he was talking about clarity. And he said, you know, most of the benefits you get from cold crashing, and he, you know, he said get it as close to freezing, even slightly below freezing if you can uh, but he said most of the benefits happen in just a, just a day or two. Right. Yeah. yeah it's just, you know, um, once you have maturation finished, you know, warm, uh, then there's nothing left to do but just simply clarify the beer. And that cold temperatures definitely help you in settling the haze and, and uh, dropping that to the bottom. And then, uh, let's see, another new chapter on uh, fruit and spiced beers. And uh, I've been making a ton of mead lately, so I've learned all about uh, uh, working with fruits. But um, can you tell us a little about uh, what you added sure. in the fruit and spice beer section? Yeah, well, that was uh, that was a fun uh, ser- chapter to write because it involved lots of experiments in the kitchen. I did um, lots of uh, spice steeping at different temperatures, um, malt steeping, specialty malt steeping. And I learned that basically there's never a good reason to boil spices or boil specialty malts especially in water, you always extract uh, kind of uh, cooked or even um, overcooked flavors. Um, in the case of spices, you know, something as you know nice as cinnamon uh, gets very harsh and woody when it's boiled. Whereas if you simply steep it at a warm temperature, now you've extracted 
the the flavors and aromas that you expect to. If you steep it in hot wort, those aromas and flavors are even nicer. And I think it's a question of you know pH, uh, the lower pH of wort uh, as opposed to strictly water. Uh, keeps those flavors a little bit mellower, a little bit cleaner than uh, they are they would be if you just steep them in water. So uh, I've included information on uh, cold steeping, hot steeping. Talk about the disadvantages of boiling. Um, put in uh, expected extracts for various fruits and vegetables as a function of their starch content, um, and. Uh, yeah, and included several recipes as well. So I think that's a chapter people will have fun with. And uh, what about boiling fruits? I don't, I don't really do it anymore. I, I pretty much just add the fruit directly. I'll clean it, uh, yeah. freeze it probably, and then and then throw it in. Yeah, I think um, blanching and or or freezing is uh, freezing is a good first step because you're looking to break up the uh, the cellular walls in the fruit and help release the uh, the the juice and so on to the beer that to the yeast so they can uh, ferment them. Um, blanching in the case of some fruits can help prevent uh, wild yeast contamination from the skins of the fruit. Um, and so that's often a good practice. Depends on how high of an alcohol the, the beer has. Um, a lot of other factors there is, you know, whether you have to or not. But um, I think it's, I think at least blanching them you know, dunking them in, in boiling hot water for just a minute uh, to to sanitize the outer si- outer skins is a good first step. Um, and then um, adding them to the beer, uh, crushing them, and uh, letting those flavors be extracted. Which uh, which fruits work best for you? Um, I've been playing mostly with tannic uh, tannic and acidic yeah. fruits because they give you a lot of structure. But uh, but what kinds of fruits have you have you had success with? Well, I've used – what have I used over the years? I've used cherries, apricots, um, orange, a um, couple of vegetables. You know, uh, the I, I agree with you that, that the ones with a, a sourness or tannic character, as you say, have a good structure and really hold up in the beer. Um, everybody knows that uh, strawberries are kind of hard to realize in a beer – that those flavors and, and aromas are very delicate. Same with the blueberries. Um, uh, um, peaches are another one that's a little hard to realize, uh, or you know, to realize that fresh peach character. Yeah, I've had beer. I've had better luck using apricots. They actually give you more yeah. of a peach flavor than uh, than peaches do. Right. Yeah. And I was just about to say that apricots are, or as you, as a substitute or as an addition to the peaches, to help support that flavor better. Um, and, uh, so I've, I've included a table in the book that gives you, uh, roughly how much, um, sugar, um, in terms of bricks, you know, refractometer reading that you can expect from your fruit. And that'll help you, you know, gauge the amount of, uh, fermentables that you're adding to the beer. Right. I mean, a lot of people don't realize, like when you add fruit to the secondary, you're actually diluting the beer pretty substantially in most cases. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, most of that fruit ferments away and it, it turns into alcohol. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you have another new chapter on brewing sour beers, which has uh, uh, become very popular now. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I try to talk about each of the different uh, <clears throat> bugs that we use. Um, Britannomyces is included in that chapter, not because it's a bacteria, but because it's often used um, in conjunction with brewing sour beers. So I talk about Britannomyces, I talk about Lactobacillus, Pediococcus, um, Acetobacter, as well as mentioning a couple other um, stray bacteria such as enterobacter which is something you really don't want in your beers yeah i don't really like acetobacter either either yeah yeah <laughs> vinegar it produces yeah. vinegar basically right yeah it's uh it's a it is a component of uh, your flanders red or ode brune type beers flanders brown um but yeah otherwise generally you don't want acetic acid or acetobacter in your in your sour beers usually you're looking at lactobacillus and and or pediococcus and Britannomyces is very useful uh, in conjunction with those the lactobacillus and 
Pediococcus in helping to clean up any diacetyl um, or other uh, fermentation byproducts that uh, occur. And uh, what do you think about, I know a lot of people using this method where they're uh, uh, throwing the bugs in, uh, you know, the bacteria before they uh, ferment the beer and then, right. uh, and then boiling it and, and fermenting it out, which gives you actually a very quick sour beer as opposed to the, you know, months to, yeah. to years it can take to produce a traditional sour. Right. Kettle souring is, is a popular technique at, uh, at brew pubs and, and small breweries around the country now. Um, first heard about it at the Craft Brewers Conference a few years ago. Um, but it has uh, become a very popular technique. And what's nice about it is it allows you to achieve uh, consistency in your sour beers pretty easily, where you mash as usual. And then once you've drained the wort to your kettle, uh, you boil it for a very short amount of time, 10 minutes, just to sanitize it. Uh, then cool it down to um, essentially fermentation temperature, but like 100 degrees, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, you know, in other words, a good bacterial growth uh, window. Pitch your bacteria and let that bacteria sour the beer for a period of 24 to 36 hours. Mm-hmm. Um until the pH gets down to about um, 3.8 thereabouts, um, and then uh, boil the wort again, and add your hops, and you know proceed with uh, an otherwise traditional brewing technique. Now you've got a lower pH beer that the yeast are able to ferment. All the sugars are there uh, because the bacteria consume very very few. Of the sugars, um, less than a degree Plato, which is like four gravity mm-hmm. points, um, and you do need to use a, I guess, a more robust strain of yeast and a little higher pitching rate. Some of the uh, European uh, yeast strains work very well with this technique, like um, O3470 and and uh, European ale, alt beer uh, yeast, and so on. Um, they they seem to be a little healthier, or sorry, more robust with these lower pHs, and uh, but now you've produced a sour beer in a short amount of time uh, that it has a very consistent sourness, and uh, so that's why it appeals to uh, your you know your your small microbreweries because they're able to turn out a product a consistent product in a in a relatively short period of time as opposed to the more traditional method of brewing the beer with yeast first and then souring it in a barrel or souring it in a keg uh, where at with the very low um, uh, residual sugars and so on it can take you know six months to a year for that beer to achieve uh, you know a suitable level of sourness yeah, I know kettle souring works great for things like Berliner Weiss, those kinds of things, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I include, uh, in the sour chapter, I include a procedure for conducting a, um, a kettle sour, and uh, as well as describing the other techniques, and uh, also include some suggestions for harvesting your own wild yeast at home, um, and... Uh, you know, using those cultures uh, for brewing sour beers as well. Nice. Well, uh, not surprisingly, the water section is greatly expanded after you <laughs> wrote uh, wrote the book, uh, the Water Book with Colin Kaminsky, right. which uh, which I, I'm sure many of the uh, listeners have read. Um, what are a few of the water topics that you added? Well, yeah, I, that, that was that was actually a tough chapter to write. You know. How do you take an entire book and condense it into one or two chapters uh, in How to Brew? Um, but what I did was I kind of focused on, you know, what does water adjustment do for the beer? And those that answer, of course, is it allows you to manipulate the pH, the pH of the mash, the pH of the wort, and the pH of the final beer. The pH of the final beer it really impacts the flavor of the beer, how those flavors are expressed to your palate. And uh, then looking at water from the sulfate and chloride uh, levels, you know, sulfate accentuates hoppiness. It accentuates and dries out the um, bitter character of the beer. 
chloride accentuates the maltiness character of the beer, makes it rounder and fuller. So by playing with those two levels in your water, you are effectively seasoning the flavors of your beer. And so I explained those in more detail. And I came up with a diagram that I call the brew cube. Um, essentially, if you take a it's not it's not a nomograph because I know you're famous for the nomographs. Yeah, no, this is this is uh, more of a diagram. Um, if you picture a Rubik's cube, and if you define the beer style by three parameters, in other words, color, uh, flavor balance, multi balanced hoppy, and uh, mineral structure, um, low medium uh, firm or soft medium firm. Um, and then you take those three beer factors and you correlate them to your water profile. And again, this is just to help people understand how to visualize thinking about their water. You look at the water in terms of the calcium level, uh, say 50, 100, 150 parts per million. You look at the water in terms of the residual alkalinity, minus 100, zero, plus 100. Um, and then you look at the uh, sulfate to chloride ratio, you know, high sulfate balanced or low or high chloride. And so the beer parameters, the uh, color, pale, amber, dark, that corresponds to residual alkalinity. The uh, flavor balance corresponds to the sulfate to chloride ratio. And the mineral structure, uh, soft, medium, firm, that corresponds to your calcium levels. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the calcium level works in conjunction with the residual alkalinity uh, and your sulfate to chloride ratio. I mean, there's a, all these water factors are kind of related, um, but the amount of minerals, the total amount of minerals dissolved in the water gives you that mineral structure that helps support the flavors of the beer. And so that's where that par parameter comes into play. And I think rather than, you know, telling people, okay, to brew an IPA, you want this much sulfate, you want that much residual alkalinity, um, you know, it helps them take a step back and just view the forest instead of the trees, instead of getting lost in the details, helps them see the big picture of how water and beer style relate and really gives them more leeway in formulating their uh, recipes than thinking that, oh, I've got, if I want to brew this style, I've got to have exactly this water profile to do it, which is really a fallacy. Yeah. I mean, I've taken to adjusting almost all of my water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Typically, I'm, I'm using lactic acid. Do, do you go into detail on uh, uh, pH adjustment? Yeah, I do. I talk about um, uh, pH adjustment with acid. Uh, I brought that in from the water book. Um, but again, I'm trying to, with, with how to brew, I'm trying to take a little softer approach than I do in the water book where, you know, I get into the gory details. Uh, how to brew is, you know, more of the big picture. How does water adjustment fit into um, brewing beer at home? And uh, I intentionally move the water chapters after the how to brew your first all grain uh, right. recipe, right. you know, to kind of – because – Water is something that is important, but not critical to success of that first mash. And most any water will produce a decent beer. It's once you've gotten, you know, all the other uh, fermentation uh, issues, you know, taken care of, recipe issues taken care of, that you can say, okay, now I'm going to, you know, look at tweaking my water and make this good beer great. And that's when we can get into all these messy details. Awesome. Um, well, you've also uh, updated a whole bunch of uh, formulas, equations, tables in the new thing. You've got new yeast tables, infusion equations, all this other stuff. Uh, right. what, what drove some of those? Well, again, it was you know, going through um, the previous edition and you know, how can I make this easier to use? Um, in some cases, uh, you know, people would ask me questions, you know, I don't understand how you got this number in your example. And so I'd go through my, num my example again and like, how did I get that? Um, so in, I re-derived uh, several of the equations, um, the decoction uh, volume that was kind of complicated before. Uh, 
and the um, you know just all those infusions and so on. They were they were they were the I just thought the equations were too complicated. So I, I took another look at them, rederived them, came up with a new model that explains um, your work gravity as a function of your water to grist ratio, and that opened up a whole series of spreadsheets which I incorporated into the book um, such that you know when you're let's say you want to brew a, a 10 a 1060 beer you know a beer with an original gravity of 1060 yeah some body you, to it yeah and let's say you know you, that you want to collect seven gallons of wort and boil that down to six gallons um, well those parameters uh, and choosing a water to grist ratio can be solved for exactly how much malt you need and how much water you need uh, with you know with just a few assumptions on, in terms of how much wort is retained by the grain and so on. And so I measured those quantities uh, in, in the lab or in the kitchen as the case may be and <laughs> put together a series of tables that um, – for uh, no sparge, for batch sparge, and for brew in a bag, um, allow you to predict how much grain you need, how much water you need to uh, achieve, you know, your wort for your batches. And so I put those tables in there to help uh, take some of the guesswork out of it. Um, and uh, so hopefully those will be really useful to people. Nice. Nice. Um, well, you spend quite a bit of time uh, discussing equipment, which has evolved pretty substantially since uh, you and I were brewing with plastic buckets in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what has changed, uh, you know, some of the equipment available uh, that maybe wasn't available 10 years ago? Yeah. Well, we've got a lot of conical fermenters these days, um, both made out of plastic and stainless steel. We've got, you know, we've gone from two kinds of fermenters, the traditional bucket or the glass carboy. Now we've got plastic carboys. We've got stainless steel buckets, plastic conicals, stainless steel conicals. I mean, there's just a whole host of different fermenters available to us. There's specialized brewing kettles available to us. It's not just the the black canning kettle that we used to have to settle for. Um, you have ball valves. You have uh, tube separators. Um, shoot, there's even there's even small glycol systems out there now for the home brewer. Um, it's uh, a lot's changed, but I th again, you know, it's easy as a home brewer to get wrapped up in all the toys. Um, but what's important is to take a step back and look at brewing from uh, priorities. You know, um, getting making sure everything's sanitized making sure you have fermentation temperature control, making sure your yeast that you pitch is healthy and of sufficient quantity. Uh, then looking at the mechanics of the boil, because the boil is where you cook your wort. Uh, it's where you cook your beer before fermentation. And if you don't cook it enough or you overcook it, you're not going to get the flavors that you anticipated. So that's very important. And then uh, finally, the recipe, you know, if you make a recipe for a beer that's, you know, 50% roast malt, well, that's going to be a pretty harsh tasting beer. Uh, you know, beers, and you and I have talked about this before at our various conferences, uh, you know, a beer recipe is a fairly simple thing. It's uh, mostly base malt, a little bit of specialty malt for some character characteristic uh, flavors, uh, but you really need to let the the base malt shine and let the fermentation shine through to have a really good beer. So those you know those are your priorities when you're a brewer. Once you've understood those, now you can start playing with the toys and playing with the water and so on. Uh, John, did you get a chance to go into uh, you know IPAs are crazy now, uh, all yeah. the rage. Uh, have you gone into detail on some of the new hopping techniques? Yeah, I talk about uh, dr hopping, uh, dry hopping quite a bit. Um, Did you go into uh, whirlpool hopping? Yeah, and there was a interesting paper by uh, Shellhammer and Malawiki a few years ago. I think it was around, well, mid-2000s, 2007 or something like that. Um, and in it, they 
did a series of experiments and came up with an equation, um, a model, if you will, for isomerization as a function of temperature. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I actually think I have a, I have, I don't know, I'm not sure it's the same paper, but I have a bookmark somewhere with exactly what that is. Yeah. So you can use that um, in our IBU models, you know, in your, our tin set equation and so on that we use for predicting IBUs in our beers. If, uh, if we say that, you know, if we're brewing uh, at altitude where boiling temperature is lower or we're whirlpool hopping where the temperature is now at, say, you know, 180 degrees or 190 degrees Fahrenheit compared to 212, um, we know that the isomerization rate is a percentage of what it would be at, you know, full boil at 100 degrees C. Right. And uh, you can use that to scale down, you know, time for time how much isomerization, how much utilization you're going to get from your hops in a Whirlpool edition. So I've included that um, in there uh, just as a fact, couple of factoids. Um, if you're at uh, 90 degrees C, um, you're looking at about 40% of the isomerization that you would get at boiling at 100 degrees C. And if you're at 80 degrees C, you're at about 15% of what yeah, you would Yeah, it drop, drops off pretty quickly as you get below yeah. below about 80 anyways. Yeah, yeah, it's exponential kind of decay. So, um, you know, that can help you uh, anticipate how much bittering that you're going to achieve from the Whirlpool edition. Um, but then, of course... The IBU itself is, um, it's in a kind of an old measurement, not really in step with today's hopping practices. No, I mean, and, you know, uh, the main reason you're doing a whirlpool hop is to extract, extract the oils out of it, right, the, the, right. The, the volatile oils that, that you won't get in the boil, right? Right, yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, we're really, we're breaking new ground when it comes to uh, hops. Um, you know, every year I go to conferences where we learn more and more about, you know, how the oils affect perceived hop aroma, um, how they don't affect it, uh, the, the what makes up bittering. Is it, you know, is it the alpha acids? Is it the oxidized alpha acids? Is it uh, uh, polyphenols from the hop cones? I mean, there's all these different components. Um, so bitterness and hopping is really a quite complicated subject. One that's still kind of ongoing, but I tried to summarize, you know, kind of where we are now, and uh, looking forward to the next update of the hops book from Stan Aronis to let yeah. me, you know, know more. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, changing pretty quickly. A lot of people are playing around with uh, hops in the primary, hops in the secondary, hops in the tertiary. Yeah, all these dry hop uh, uh, things too. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another one I want to ask you about, uh, troubleshooting. You got, uh, you know, you had a few lines, uh, on each of the, uh, things in troubleshooting, but it looks like you've got a more extensive, uh, uh, you know, uh, discussion in the new book, right? Yeah. I, I went back and looked at, uh, topics such as acetaldehyde, diacetyl, you know, these two of the major compounds that we're trying to clean up in maturation and tried to expand on those a bit more, uh, explain, how um, those and esters are formed uh, during fermentation and how best to get rid of them, you know, and not esters, of course, but the acetaldehyde and diacetyl, how to, you know, uh, optimize the fermentation and maturation to clean those up. Uh, so that's, that's incorporated in the, in the troubleshooting section. Um, lots of new recipes in the book, too. Um, you know, all the old favorites are there and then i added oh gosh i think another 25 recipes or so uh to the new edition uh sours fruit beers uh russian imperial stouts uh several ipas uh, i got a red ipa a brown ipa black ipa um didn't do the white ipa not my favorite but uh, no you know uh you know Got to be, got to be me. Got to, got to, can only put in there what I've brewed. So, right. Um, well, the last thing I noticed, uh, the appendix is uh, is quite a bit longer. We cover almost everything from you know how to season your equipment to uh, <laughs> you yeah. know, beer clarity, beer color, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the things you added? 
Um, I added a, appendices on um, gluten-free because that is a popular topic now. And um, Yeah, what are your thoughts on gluten-free brewing? Well, you can do it if you use entirely gluten-free ingredients such as sorghum. <laughs> such as sorghum mm -hmm. and uh, but when it comes to barley and wheat um, and oats and rye uh, gluten of course and, and gluten intolerance is primarily prim yeah, primarily associated with wheat but rye oats barley have very similar uh, proteins in them uh, and when it comes to celiac disease and gluten intolerance, you know, it, there's actually like, you know, over 400 similar proteins and compounds that can trigger uh, this um, autoimmune reaction um, in people. There are enzymes that can attack um, these proteins to some extent, break down the uh, the proline amino acid uh, and kind of break up these proteins that tend to cause these immune reactions. Right, and that, that lets you brew a regular beer potentially and make it, you know, kind of gluten-free or almost gluten-free. Right, yeah. Well, I think what we have to do is we have to say that those beers are gluten-reduced. Right. Because, again, we know we can – we know with enzymes we can target – uh, the majority of these proteins and break them down uh, into smaller and, and non-immuno response sizes. But again, there are so many potential compounds that could uh, impact um, a person with, the, with this condition that um, you would have to do a you know a study, a, a controlled clinical study to verify that each of these was, uh, reduced or eliminated so and that that the scope of that and the human trials necessary are just kind of really um i don't know at the moment uh, uh beyond e you know economics uh so i think looking forward we can expect to um, make our own beers gluten reduced with enzymes or we can brew truly gluten-free beers with sorghum but um having uh, all beers able to be say stated as gluten free is uh, not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, yeah. Complicated uh, subject. Yeah, but I tried to explain it in the appendix. Yeah, I think the enzymes are pretty attractive, though, at least for a lot of people. Um, right. Because right. they do get in my, most cases they get the the threshold well below the sensitivity of most people. Anyways, there's always a few people, and just like right. there's a few people who are really sensitive to sulfites and wines, you know. Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, John, well, uh, your closing thoughts, uh, summary maybe about uh, what you learned writing the new book? Well, you know, I learned uh, once again how broad uh, brewing is. I mean, how much potential is there out there for new recipes, new styles, uh, new techniques? Um, I've traveled all over the world in the last few years and I'm always meeting new brewers with, you know, fresh enthusiasm, new ingredients um, that they're willing to try. I've tasted some amazing beers, and I've tried to incorporate, you know, some of those ingredients and some of those techniques into this edition of How to Brew. Try to keep it current. Um, try to provide um, some of the technical information that I've learned myself over the years, and make you make the reader aware of it. Um, you know, I just want to facilitate good brewing. So hopefully this new edition um, doesn't go too too deep into the details that keeps it fun, keeps it fresh, and uh, people really enjoy it. Well, thank you, John. It's uh, It's been a pleasure once again having you on the show. Look forward to seeing you at uh, Homebrew Con next month. Um, yeah. John, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, uh, today my guest was John Palmer, uh, author of How to Brew in the uh, new fourth edition. You can uh, follow John on his website at uh, howtobrew.com. Thank you, John. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. 
Every issue is packed with great information for homebrewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic deal now and get 20% off when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2017 at BeerAndBrewing.com. Again, that's BEERSMITH2017 at BeerAndBrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the Cornicle Combined Fermentation and Kegging System. Ferment in a keg with a conical bottom attached, and then just swap the bottom out, carbonate, and serve from the same keg. Find out more about the Cornicle at BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers that lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial from Beersmith.com today. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.